Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of the Fleet Success Show. My name is Tony Yankovich and I'll be your host today. I'm super excited to have Hall of Famer Steve Salsgiver join me today. Steve's a regular contributor to the Fleet Success Show, not just because he works here at RTA with us, but he really is one of the great fleet minds and thought leaders in the industry. Uh, Steve's experience managing fleets, advising to fleets, and sharing his knowledge through podcasts and blogs, webinars, and industry conferences and workshops is unmatched. So we're really lucky to have him with us today. And uh, we're going to pick his brain for the next 30 minutes or so. So as you may have guessed it by my hat, I'm a huge Kansas City Chiefs fan growing up and living uh, most of my life in the Kansas City area. So after the last big win on Sunday, I was tempted to go rogue on this podcast and then do an entire episode on the Chiefs road to the Super Bowl and what it's going to take for them to win their third championship in four years. But. I do love working here at RTA, so I figured I'd better stick with talking about fleet instead of the Chiefs for the next 35 minutes or so. So with that said, over the last few months, we've done a lot of podcasts and blogs talking about fleet performance, uh, mostly from an overarching perspective, you know, really looking at things from the 35,000 foot level. Uh, we've discussed what fleet performance means, uh, the fundamental elements of fleet performance, what you should be reporting, how you should be reporting that, the frequency of reporting, essentially the what, the whys, and the hows of managing performance and tracking meaningful, meaningful KPIs within your fleet. So today we're going to take that information and knowledge that we've already uh, shared, and we're going to go in a little more depth and talk about some specific things that you can do to improve performance in a few critical areas. Now, we could probably spend an entire podcast talking about each one of these locations or each one of these areas or topics, but today what we're going to do is we're going to hit on the key elements of uh, things that you can put in place in your fleet organization today that can help you improve performance. So with that, um, the first question I'm going to ask Steve is we talk a lot about the importance of conducting regular and thorough PMs or preventive maintenance services and how a solid PM program is really one of the most important areas of any fleet maintenance operation. Steve, in your experience, what are some of the ways that an organization can work to improve PM compliance? Well, I think the first thing you can do is actually track it. You know, a lot of people uh, try to do it on spreadsheets or on pieces of paper. I think the very first thing is you need to have a, a, a robust fleet management information system. Uh, if you have a system like that, it will actually produce notifications, um, alerts, you know, and, and it'll also give you statistics and reports and things so that you can keep on top of it. So I think that's the very first thing you need to do. There's no, in fact, I don't know any other way to do it unless you have a, a regular system that uh, gives you that information. Um, then you have to be vigilant and go uh, and communicate with all your users. Make sure you schedule proactively uh, at a time that's convenient for them. A lot of people criticize me sometimes because I, I really think sometimes the fleet should be working uh, off-hour shifts, not day shifts when other people are working, um, so that they can get a handle on the preventive maintenance after hours, you know, when the vehicle is not moving around. But I think that's truly how you improve your PM compliance. And then lastly, what you need to do essentially is track it and graph it. You know, we recently had a, uh, a engagement with one of our clients where we started out, you know, they had somewhere around 40% PM compliance. Uh, after almost a year, we've got that up to almost 80% compliance. And all that happens is just tracking it, graphing it, and showing it and sharing it with the team so that they can see everybody wants to improve. Everybody likes to uh, to win. You know, you talked about the Kansas City Chiefs. We all yeah. want to win, all of us, you know, so that that's really the way to do it. Well, Steve, those are great points. And, and you touched on something that I think is uh, very important and you kind of alluded to it, but it's the education process that it, that goes along with your PM program. So many people are experienced with maintaining their own vehicles that they don't really understand the concept of what a true PM is uh, in the fleet world. Um, it's so much more than just a fluid and filter change. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about how you can educate some of the, you know, whether you're supporting a department or a division or, or drivers, can you tell them a little bit about the difference between what, what we consider in the fleet industry a PM versus what uh, you can drive down the street and get, you know, for forty nine ninety nine. Well, you, you and I are both big advocates of uh, preventive maintenance training. Um, and I don't know if you have, but I have conducted and, and built several training programs around preventive maintenance, you know, throughout my uh, career as a fleet manager and also as a consultant. And so I've done some on-site uh, training. I think the most important thing you need to do is build that into your cadence if you're a fleet manager. Um, everybody needs training. Everybody needs um, focused, up-to-date training. Uh, all that information is generally available through the the uh, original manufacturers. You know they provide um, owner manuals, things like that. So you can put together a training program. And one thing I like to do after I put together a training program to take people through things like um, the individual uh, preventive maintenance checklist, things that you should be checking. Uh, I like to also have a certification program where I I take all my mechanics and uh, technicians and certify each and every one of them through a training program and actually give them a certificate that they have been trained in the way of ABC Fleet or whoever you're managing your fleet. Uh, by doing that, it really lends the credence to the program and the importance that you place on preventive maintenance. Well, I think so, Steve, and that's a great idea. And I, and I really like to see that training even stretch out to the customers that you support. You know, it, once they understand why we're doing a PM and why the frequency is what it is and what it entails, then I think we get a lot more buy-in from the users. Um, you know, on a lot of our consulting engagements, uh, we meet with customers and we talk to them about their experience with fleet. And a lot of them were saying, well, you know, they want our vehicle every three months and, you know, every 7,500 miles. And, you know, we just can't give up the vehicle. You made a great point about doing PMs off hours, which I, I completely agree with you. But I think also educating them with why are we doing this? We're doing this uh, robust PM program. So to avoid future breakdowns, I mean, really what we're trying to do is catch things before they become issues. So I, I like your education and your training to expand beyond just the fleet people, but also to the uh, the people that are using the vehicles. You made a good point. Um, one of the things I used to do, well, I've done it several times, is do a, a short little orientation to each of the customers. You can tell them exactly those kinds of things. Um, so when you engage with your customers, you know, let them know the importance of that. And, and really let them know that you're trying to help them. It's, we're not trying to take the vehicle away from you so you can't do your job. We're actually taking the vehicle away from you when it's convenient so that you can actually continue to do your job and not have to worry about breaking down. So that's really exactly. what you need to kind of let them know. Well, and, and you mentioned um, notifications and, and, you know, most uh, fleet management information systems create um, some type of notifications, whether it be automatic, whether it be based on, you know, uh, intervals that you've set up in the system or, or however you set that up. But I think it's important also for a follow up mechanism. You know, uh, we're not going to get 100 percent PM compliance generally. Um, and there's good reasons for that. You know, this piece of equipment's on the job site and it's going to be there for another 30 days and we can't move it because it's just uh, too important to the job site. So we're going to delay that PM for a while. But for those people who just simply fail to bring their vehicle in for a PM, you know, what are the ways that we can escalate those notifications to maybe uh, eventually um, ping the right person to, uh, you know, come down on them and say, hey, listen, this is important and we need you to get that in. You know, I mean, I, I would exhaust every possibility of, you know, contacting the primary contact to make sure they understand the importance of bringing it in. But there is obviously you could build in escalation processes where you could go to their next level up supervisor. Um, you could go past that, do a skip up to the next supervisor if you can. I mean, at some point in time, somebody has to understand that the longer you delay and the longer you push that preventive maintenance out, the more apt it's going to be to have a catastrophic failure. Um, you know, and worse comes to worse. I've seen some fleet managers actually uh, shut off their fuel access, things like <laughs> that. You know, that's a little punitive in my mind sometimes. But, um, you know, whatever it takes to get that vehicle in, you need to be able to do that. Because ultimately, when that vehicle fails or you blow up an engine, they're going to come to you first. You know, and, and you don't want to, you know, you, and you should take responsibility for that if you're a fleet manager. 
So you need to do everything you can to get that vehicle in on a timely basis. Absolutely, Steve. You know, one of the things that uh, we've suggested it for some clients because they had a real issue with PM compliance was in addition to shutting off the, the fuel card or uh, maybe as opposed to that is uh, simply charge them. If you have a chargeback rate system in place, um, we simply suggested charging them for the PM, whether they uh, came in and, and received the service or not, because their supervisors who are looking at that budget and looking at those costs on a regular basis are saying, okay, now we're being charged with this, you know, these services and, and goods that we're not even consuming. So uh, maybe you better get that vehicle in. So Steve, these are all great ideas. Um, and we could, we could really talk about PMs for the next, you know, probably two days, <laughs> but let's go ahead and move on. Um, well, lastly, I've just okay. had, you thought, I thought about the chargeback system. Everybody should have that. I mean, that's actually critical. Um, but I mean, you could have something in there like a, a miss PM penalty fee. You know, oh, that's a great that, idea. Those are things that um, you could put in there and start tracking those and give out reports to you know upper management. And nobody's going to really want to call on the carpet for missing a PM. So. Right. Or, Steve, or what a great idea. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, rental car companies do it all the time. They have late fees. If you rent a vehicle and you bring it back later than you're supposed to and don't notify them. So a late fee or a, some type of penalty fee, that's a great idea. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the things I, I usually tell people is when I when we do these things together or Steve, when you and I are on site meeting with a client, I always learn something new every day from you. So I just learned something new. That's a great idea. It's going to be on my next recommendation for my next client <laughs> engagement. <laughs> so that's fantastic. Um, so the next question I wanted to talk a little bit about with you, Steve, was we know the importance of a PM program. We know it's going to help limit breakdowns and de decrease the number of unscheduled repairs in our fleet. But are there other things that we can do within our fleet organization to increase the mean time between failures? Well, yeah, I think a couple of the good things you can do, obviously, is everybody should be required or mandated to do a pre-trip a pre -trip and a post-trip inspection of their vehicle. Um, that's an absolute. I know they used to be like, when you rented a car, they would make you go through that. They're not so diligent anymore or vigilant about that. And even if you're just um, a light-duty vehicle, you should still do that. Um, you need to ensure that vehicle is safe for you to operate, and that gives you an opportunity to take five to ten minutes to walk around the vehicle, you know, check for uh, tires that may not have tread on them, listen to the engine to make sure it's not uh, missing or having weird and strange noises to it. And that really gives you an opportunity to catch those issues before they fail. You know, and the more you do that and the more you share that information with your uh, ma management, fleet management team, the more they can uh, take that information and look at it during the preventive maintenance process. Absolutely. I think the importance of, of the pre-trip and post-trip inspection can't be uh, overstated. Um, obviously, for commercial vehicles, you're required to by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. So they do have a required pre-trip inspection and post-trip, and it's very detailed. I mean, it is not a a, a two-minute walk-around inspection on those commercial vehicles. It's a very detailed and thorough uh, inspection and and I think the importance of of expanding those pre trip and post trip inspections to not only the federally mandated vehicles but also to every vehicle in your fleet, like you mentioned Steve when we we travel quite a bit and we have rental cars i mean there's not one time that I don't do a walk around inspection and note any major scratches or dings or dents because when you bring that vehicle back, you will get dinged for that and charged for those things if you don't do your own pre trip inspection. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that's that's just a critical, conscientious thing to do. I mean, you are taking that vehicle out in the public, and it needs to be safe, not only for yourself but for those that you're driving around. Right, and you know, I I think you know, personal stories and personal uh, analogies are always good. And I don't want to throw one of my sons under the bus, but just a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, he drives uh, his own car to school every day, and um, he's halfway to school in the morning um, two weeks ago, and he calls me and said, "Dad, my uh, my tire, my my car is pulling." strongly to the right. I think there's something wrong with my tire. I said, well, okay, when you get in a lot at school, get out and take a look. And of course he gets to school. Thank goodness school's only about two miles from our house. And he pulls in parks and, and the tire is literally almost flat. I mean, there, there, there may be a little bit of air in the tire. Thank goodness it didn't damage any of the wheels or rims or anything. But 
you know, I've even told the kids before you get in your car and drive to school, before you go to the practice or game or whatever you're doing, take a quick walk around, especially in the winter, make sure your tires are inflated properly. And, you know, if he, if he would have just taken the time to walk around the vehicle, um, he would have seen that. And we could, you know, we've got a little air compressor in the garage. We could have uh, filled up the tire and wouldn't have been an issue. And so I asked him, I said, you know, you have an onboard, uh, what is it, TPS system um, do, to that identifies you when your tires are low. And I said, Brad, I turn your car on. It's on. Why didn't you tell someone? Why didn't you stop and go get air? He goes, eh, it's always on. I'm like, thanks a lot, dude. <laughs> so let us know and let us, you know, fix that before it becomes a real issue. So we were lucky to get it taken care of. But, uh, you know, even for those that just have vehicles at home, I think, you know, walk around inspection is pretty important. That's a really good point. A lot of people see those warning lights and alerts on the dash and they don't even pay attention to them. <laughs> anymore you know and it's uh that's a good time to remind people those are there for a purpose absolutely i couldn't agree on couldn't agree more well steve moving on to the next question um so maybe someday not in the foreseeable future i don't think and probably not uh, while we're still working but we will have autonomous vehicles that maybe never require m and r or that the maintenance repair are done by robots, uh, which, you know, hey, <laughs> uh, if we rely on Elon Musk, that'll probably happen sooner rather than later. But until that time comes, um, what are some of the things that a fleet can do to at least minimize downtime and reduce the time that a vehicle or piece of equipment needs to stay in the shop for whether it's receiving a PM service or maintenance or, or repair? Well, again, I go back to the very first, the very first thing you should do is track it. You know, you can't measure what you can't see, or, you can, or how's that going? Which, you know, so you'd be able to be able to track it. You know, I mean, we recently did another an engagement where we were tracking uh, vehicle availability. You know, and just by tracking vehicle availability, um, downtime, um, you know, hours in the shop. I mean, most things that somewhere around eighty to ninety percent of your repairs should be out of that shop within twenty four hours. You know, about twenty percent of your repairs may be longer than forty eight hours. And then somewhere around, you know, five, 10 percent of repairs might be longer than 72 hours. But you should have metrics in place that you can track those type of uh, measurements so that you have a good handle on that. And the more you track and the more you uh, have data, the more you can dig into it if you have a, a, a problem in your operation. So, I mean, we were able to take a availability, for example, just by tracking it on a daily basis from 70 to almost 90 percent, 95 percent. You know, and that's, it's just simply by making it visual, making everybody see it every day, you know, and no one, once you get up to 95%, no one wants to see a slip back to 90, you know, so it just keeps that uh, present in mind. And it's, it's the best thing you can do is simply just track that information. Now, the other thing you can do too, is have a shop that's fully equipped, you know, with the right tools, the right diagnostics equipment, um, the right trained mechanics and technicians. You know, the right equipment, a good environment, it's clean and safe. All those things uh, add to minimize downtime. Well, Steve, that, that brings us up to another um, kind of a sub-element of the same question. And, you know, you really hit on it. And that's what are we going to do in our own shop versus what are we going to have commercial vendors do? You know, we talk a lot about specialization and, you know, um, more often than not, your shop, whether it's a trucking shop or, a, you know, a tref, uh, refuse truck shop or just, a you know, maybe a government fleet operation, you're probably not going to do much body work anymore. You're probably not going to do be straight in any any frames. You're probably not going to be doing a ton of upfill fitting and and probably aren't going to be doing large component rebuilds. But you know, just about every time you send your vehicle out, if you have an in like in house shop and send it to a vendor for the special repair or because you just don't have the capacity in your shop, you know, this week or whatever the reason may be, that takes time. That that's going to ex extend your downtime for that asset more than likely. Yeah, I agree. You should hold your vendors accountable to the same standards you hold your mechanics to internally. I mean, if you inspect your mechanics, do a quality control inspection or QCI, we call them the business, you should be doing that periodically with your maintenance vendors. You know, just set up a time to go on site, walk through with their mechanics or with their shop foreman and let them show, know what you expect. Kind of, it's that, kind of that thing, you know, inspect what you expect. 
kind of a, mm-hmm. a you know and if you let them know that uh, you know it's important you're doing the work for us we expect you to do it this way you know and, and you know again build in punitive things or whatever you need to do the processes procedures make them use your inspection sheet that you have you know whatever it takes they need to be doing the same thing to mirror that for you because ultimately you're your mechanic and you're responsible for them you're so right steve you know in and to touch on what you said earlier you know we really can't uh, define our performance unless we're keeping score i mean you know the chiefs and, and the ravens they kept score last week to determine who was going to whose performance was good enough to go on to the next game and i think your shop needs to do the same thing now you know, most of the organizations that we work with, not all, but most um, are not a for-profit organization. So they're not looking to make money on all of this, these services and repairs. Um, so we're not recommending typically to use, you know, the flat rate times or standard repair times. But I do think it's important that at least we track that information and we report on it because, you know, if we're taking two or three times as long to do a break job, as as we should be on a specific class of vehicle, then maybe we have an issue. Maybe we have, um, you know, uh, a training issue with a specific technician. Maybe we just have people that don't care and they're not, you know, in a hurry because they don't see the the relevance of that. So I think it is important to, like you said, let's let's track this stuff, let's measure it, let's manage it, let's post it, let's make everyone aware of it. Good point. I, I think standard repair times are critical in a shop. You got to have that. You also need to track direct labor. You know how much time you're spending on uh, your mechanic is turning a wrench, for example. Um, that's critical because if your mechanics are only turning wrenches less than fifty percent of the time, maybe you don't need a mechanic. Maybe you need a helper. You know, you need to use those metrics to drive the right uh, activity and behavior in your shop. Well, exactly. And the other thing that I like to see is, you know, a lot of the work that we do in shops um, is what I call deferred maintenance, deferred repairs. You know, yeah, I have this issue, but it's not a safety issue. It's not going to, you know, hinder me from doing my my regular, you know, operation. But you know what? Next time it's in the shop or next time I have a break or a rainy day, I really would like to get this fixed. So some of that deferred maintenance stuff, you know, if we can schedule it in advance, then the shop knows about it and then they can have the parts available. You know, a lot of people are going to just in time parts where they're not ordering the 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 parts until the need comes because they don't want to carry the inventory on the shelf. They don't want to carry the money on the books. So they're doing the just in time thing, which is great in most aspects. But if that's going to delay the repair of the of the of the asset, then we really need to rethink some of that. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit, Steve, about um, uh, how the maintenance and repair effort is correlated to the age of the assets in your fleet. I think we all understand or have heard about or have seen the economic theory of vehicle replacement or at least seen the illustrations and the graphs that show the impact age has on both the cost of the asset from the CapEx side as well as from the operating side. So I, I think we're on video, but you know the, the capital cost of the vehicle is highest at the point when you first acquire it. And then over time, the capital or the value of that asset decreases until it finally kind of flattens out when you get towards the end of the useful life of that asset. And at the same time, the operating cost, so the cost of fueling, the cost of maintenance and repair, starts off very low and then increases over time. Now, one of the things that that we have to remind our fleets that we work with is that that optimum replacement point in time, whether it be at six years or whether it be at 12 years for whatever asset it is, it's going to be different for every asset. And fundamentally, the the value of that asset decreases over time, um, meaning that the fuel and maintenance uh, cost will, will increase at the same time. So essentially, a younger fleet is going to be cheaper to own and operate. But how do we know what that point is? How do we know when we should replace a specific asset or a class of assets? Well, again, I think you need to track it. I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, if you, those of us in the fleet business, we see the maintenance curve versus the capital curve. You know, where those two uh, curves meet based on life cycle costs, that's where we typically start to get an idea where to replace it. I mean, the, the curve actually flattens out a little bit, so you've got a number of years there, two to three years, where you can capital or you can actually replace it. 
But again, that that comes back to that question we talked about earlier. You got to have the data, you know. So you got to track all your maintenance costs. You got to track all your capital cost depreciation, residual values, all those things that uh, lead into that formula. And it's a, it's always been interesting to me. I mean, I I've seen fleets that are hardly used you know, when it comes to utilization, and those that are used quite a bit, and they usually come out around the same years when it comes to replacement, which is really a weird dynamic I've never been able to figure out, or at least it doesn't make sense to me, but I've seen it. And so you need to be able to track that. So, because you always have these people out there that say, oh, we hardly put any miles on our fleet. They don't, we don't need to replace them. Well, I can tell you looking at the data that that's not correct because <laughs> I've seen it both ways. We're underutilized vehicles. And, you know, maybe those are things like environment, weather, driver behavior, you know, you know, just things that are not related to miles that are causing those issues. Great point. And I think really when we look at fleet renewal, we really need to look at it in a couple of different ways. I think we need to look at it from the, the strategic perspective. You know, if we have a fleet of a couple hundred vehicles or a couple thousand vehicles, I think you really need to know, you know, whether it be a 10-year, 15-year, or even a 20-year planning horizon, um, how much money do we expect? to replace every year in vehicle replacements. You know, the folks that are managing the purse strings and the budgets, they need to know. We can't just blindside them and say, hey, we need $450,000 this year to replace these 10 vehicles. You know, it's always better to have a plan, have that identified well in advance so people can start planning on that. But I think the other thing that needs to be tied into those fleet renewal plans is the tactical decision-making. You know, just because this vehicle is scheduled to be replaced at eight years, maybe we have a little bit lower utilization. Maybe we have a very conscientious driver that takes care of the vehicle. Uh, Maybe this vehicle, for some reason, is in great condition, very little maintenance repair uh, on it. But at the same time, you might have that same vehicle in that same class being scheduled for replacement, you know, in, in, in eight years. But at year six, that vehicle's in the shop once a month. There's an issue with it. Now, I know we don't have as many, quote unquote, lemons uh, anymore, but there are still vehicles that should be, you know, uh, taken out of the fleet sooner rather than later. And ha- what kind of factors do you look at, Steve, when you make those annual tactical decisions on when what vehicles to replace? Well, I think the first thing you do is you take a look at their their maintenance cycle. And, their, you know, I mean, you look at that graph and see where they're at. But typically maintenance costs, and downtime are those two things that you look at. Um, for example, if it's down a lot and it's out of service a lot and you have a number of high cost maintenance items on that vehicle, that's a good time to look at it. So you have to have some kind of a priority process that you go through. So at the end of the year, you take a look at all your vehicles that you have scheduled for replacement or all of your vehicles in general. You can actually look at those that may not be scheduled just to make sure that you, you uh, have them on the list and in front of you. Because I think sometimes, like to your point, they may be uh, prematurely wearing out or prematurely breaking down. So you want to have a way to prioritize those vehicles. You know, one of the things that uh, yeah, I was thinking about, you know, we talked about chargeback systems a while back. We, You and I know we see people that have chargeback systems at $45 an hour in their shop. You know, mm-hmm. that's how much they charge for the mechanic. Well, if you continually charge that low rate, your vehicle is never going to come up for replacement for a long time. Because the going rate now is like $200 an hour, right? So you got to make sure you have your right charge back at the right so your maintenance costs are reflected accurately in your operation. So true, Steve. I, you know, a lot of times we'll do formal um, uh, you know, life cycle analysis or optimum replacement cycle analysis. And, and part of the calculation is your maintenance repair costs. Well, it's not only parts, but it's also that labor. And if your labor rate's wrong, that's going to throw off that optimum replacement cycle uh, recommendation. So instead of repair, replacing something at eight years when you should be, that the math is going to tell you to replace it. Oh, no, you can keep it for 18 years. <laughs> and, and we've actually seen that. We've seen organizations that have argued that, no, 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 we should be keeping this you know, uh, three-quarter ton pickup truck 18 to 22 years because that's what the math says. And then we we dig into that calculation and say, well, yeah, at a fifty dollar an hour labor rate, sure, <laughs> that that's what it's going to come out to. But when we fully calculate your fully burdened labor rate, and it's one hundred eighty five dollars an hour, now you can see the impact that has on the calculation. And guess what? You know, our eight to ten year um, 
window is probably a lot more accurate than your you know 18 to 22 year window for replacement. And it's funny, a lot of fleet managers think a lower labor rate uh, is favorable to them, you know, where they actually shoot themselves in the foot because they end up sending a message to, to management. Uh, maybe they're trying not to get outsourced or whatever it is. I don't know, but they end up sending a message to management that our mechanics do this for next to nothing. We should always do internal labor, and that inevitably keeps the vehicles longer, which is a detriment to them. In the end, <laughs> Steve, I, and I'm sure you have the same story uh, over and over again. But you know, sometimes we go in and we we I, we do that. We look at their chargeback rate structures and what's your what's your labor you know shop labor rate, and they'll say, oh, it's you know sixty two dollars an hour. And then when we dig into it, okay, how did you get to this number? Well, we did a survey. We called all the shops around us. You know, whether the government shops, the shops down the road, you know, Bob's repair shop, uh, and, and we saw what they were all charging and we wanted to be the lowest so we set ours lower than anybody else's <laughs> and yeah. it's like okay but now we're not looking at the data <laughs> correctly <laughs> so uh, it, it's you know we, we get to see and, and and laugh at a lot of funny things in the fleet industry but you know that's why it's important like you said steve you know and and if your labor rates higher than everybody else's maybe we need to look at something why why is that and we can use a chargeback rate structure and and model those costs and identify why is it maybe it's our indirect cost maybe our costs from you know that are, that we are charged to support everybody else whether it be payroll and hr and le the legal team and you know the camp uh, you know maintaining the vehicle or the the buildings on the campus maybe those are really high for our organization and you know generally indirect costs should be somewhere between 10 and 15 percent typically you know if your indirect costs are somewhere in the 25 to 35 percent um, then we know hey our our labor costs may not be wrong it's those indirect costs that are impacting our labor rates well you know i've seen that some of the clients that we've been out on site with i've seen one where fleet's an internal service fund and so they end up throwing all the inter and indirect costs into the fleet you know, I've seen one fleet where they had like 20, 30 percent just in uh, IT expenses, which is outrageous, you know, and that was because uh, they were an internal service fund and the city felt like they could dump all that in their fleet, which affected their rate, which made them non-competitive to the outside world. You know, so you got to really look at that. And again, it comes back to everything we've talked about on this call today or this podcast today. And it's you got to track things. You got to track all these measurements. You got to track all this data. Um, if you're too high on your labor rate, if the going rate out externally to you is 185 bucks, uh, and you're at 200 dollars, then you need to know that because there's things you can do to cut that labor rate down. You know, you can do a lot of things. It could be your mechanics are taking too long. It could be you aren't staging your PM parts. It could be uh, you're not optimizing your processes. You know, using lean and uh, six sigma processes right it could be anything and if you don't have that data you can't drill into the actual root cause i i wish more people understood that steve i you know it's just because our our, our parts mark up or our labor rates higher than what we would want or the industry standard or what our peers are doing don't be embarrassed i you know embrace that number and let's find out why you know like you said maybe you know uh, maybe there's costs in there that we shouldn't be paying for. Maybe we have a training issue. Maybe we have an efficiency issue. Um, I, you know, I remember a couple studies you've done where you've optimized their PM processes. And simply by moving and restaging the equipment in that PM maintenance bay and having the parts available through parts kits and having the equipment available and having the tools necessary and eliminating technician steps, I mean, literally steps that they are taking during the process that can really have a huge impact on your efficiency. Well, I've always shared the one I've did in a couple of fleets. I've, I've done it twice, but one, we actually had a guy doing an eight hour PM that we got down to two hours. I mean, that's like a three to 400% improvement. And it, all it is, is just optimizing the process. It's that simple. Exactly. It's crazy, crazy stuff, but it's great stuff, Steve. Um, you know, we, we have a few more minutes, so we might as well hit on this next one. Obviously, the cost of fuel has a significant impact on fleet costs. Um, what can we do as a fleet manager to control the cost of fuel? Well, a couple of things. 
I'm going to be like a broken record. You got to track it. <laughs> <laughs> got to have the data in front of you, you know, and be able to track all the gallons and all the frequencies of use and however many times they fill up that vehicle. Once you have all that data in place, then you need to be able to look at things like uh, utilization, miles per gallon, uh, cost per mile, things like that on where your fuel is uh, is at, you know, and yeah, then that lets you drill. If you've got somebody, for example, if you've got a class of vehicles like, uh, let's say, like an SUV class, and the average uh, miles per gallon is somewhere around 18 miles a gallon. Just throw a number out there. But you've got a couple of people out there that are uh, somewhere around uh, five miles a gallon. You want to know that because there's something going on. you got to get to the root cause of why that's happening. You know, is it the driver with a lead foot? Is it a guy putting in the wrong type of fuel? Is the guy fueling at the the wrong place at the high cost? Is it somebody stealing fuel? Is there fraud involved? Is there misuse involved? So you need to know all those things. That's why you got to track that data. And if you track that data accurately, you'll be able to minimize your fuel costs. Right. And I think, you know, we talked about fleet renewal. You know, you're, the, the newer vehicles today have much better fuel efficiency. So just by renewing your vehicles, you're going to you're gonna improve your, your fuel efficiency and lower your fuel costs. So I think that's one thing. I think another thing that, that a lot of people don't necessarily think about is right typing your vehicle. You know, if just because you had a three quarter ton pickup truck used in this application for the last you know five ten years doesn't mean that's the appropriate type of vehicle anymore today maybe that a half ton pickup truck is just as capable has just the pay the same payload requirements uh, and capacity as the three quarter ton truck ten years ago did and you're going to get better fuel mileage so I think there's a lot of things that that people can look at when they are looking at the type of vehicle for the mission that they're using it for. It's a really good point. You and I have seen it where somebody um, replaces a vehicle and it's say it's a 110 truck and then code enforcement needs a vehicle where they could use a golf cart and then they end up with a 110 truck because it was available. You know, all those things add to higher fuel costs. And so you need to be strategic and tactical in the way you do this. Right, right. You know, and I think the other thing that, uh, I, I, again, it's not going to save you a bunch of money uh, today, but it's one of those things just to keep in mind. But, you know, for every 100 pounds that you remove from your vehicle, your fuel efficiency increases by 1% to 2%. And again, not a whole lot if we're just removing 100 pounds. But, you know, if you have some of these work trucks that you have every possible piece of equipment on it just in case, Man, you're you're really do, impacting your fuel efficiency in that vehicle. And not to overlook, uh, going back to your original uh, story a little earlier, tire pressure mm-hmm. is a huge one. You can save somewhere between uh, you know five percent, eight percent, just having the right tire pressure in your vehicle at all times. Yeah, will you tell my son that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, good, Steve. This is great stuff as always. Um, you know, I, I we're running out of time uh, for this uh, episode or this of uh, the Fleet Success Show, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. But um, Steve, another big thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Uh, I learn from you every day. Hopefully, others that are listening and, and joining us on this podcast are are learning and listening. Uh, to what you what you have uh, seen out in the in the real world. I mean, your, your experience is real world experience, not just textbook theory things that you've learned in a book. But you've actually experienced this being a fleet manager on the ground, dealing with these issue, these issues on a day to day basis. So, really appreciate your continued contribution to the show. Um, for those that are listening, if you have any comments on this episode or uh, any suggestions for topics for future episodes. Please send us a note at podcast at rtafleet.com. Feel free to share this podcast with your friends, your staff, others in the fleet industry. Uh, Our goal here at RTA is to help fleet succeed, and we hope that these regular podcasts will help you succeed in your fleet operation. With that, we'll sign off for today and wish everyone to have a great week. Thank you. Great success.